knowledge of the land on which we gather today is the traditional and seated Algonquin territory. Je m'appelle Colette Rivet. I am the executive director of Canada's Canada Association, uh, the leading organization of Canada's licensed producers of medical cannabis under Health Canada's Access to Cannabis for Medical Purposes regulations. We represent a majority of the licensed producers and are growing fast. In fact, just this week we welcomed three new members. So we're very excited about our uh, association and its activities. Uh, this conference is our first and we are particularly excited about the timing. Indeed, with the legislation tabled by the Government of Canada just two weeks ago, Canada stands on the cusp of a world leadership position and a new and exciting industry sector, and Canada's licensed producers are being entrusted with playing an important part. We're ready. Since 2013, Canada's licensed producers have been effective partners to the federal government for the establishment of a strict, well-regulated system for the production and distribution of medical cannabis that is the envy of the world. Canada's licensed producers have proven that they can deliver state-of-the-art, sanitary, secure, and professionally operated production facilities. Consistent, high-quality products protected from contamination and fully traceable in the event a recall is needed. Products packaged and labeled to protect children and ensure that adults have information to make informed choices. A wide array of products available at different price points. A proven distribution and retail system that ensures products reach their intended recipients with no diversion to the illegal market. And production and retail without impact on the surrounding communities or co-location with alcohol. Our association actively participated in the consultation process undertaken by the Task Force on Cannabis Legalization and Regulation in 2016, which led to the thorough and thoughtful report it submitted to the Government of Canada in December, much of which we see reflected in the new legislation. Canada, Canada's Canada is pleased to note the significant role that licensed producers, large and small, will play in the new system and that medical cannabis system is being recommended to retain post-legalization. We share the government's desire to ensure that cannabis uh, is kept out of the hands of youth and see that the black market may get shut down. In that regard, while we are in complete support of prohibiting advertising and promotion that is directed at children, we are hoping to see better recognition of the fact that consumers need information about an unfamiliar product to help them to have a safe and consistent experience that they need to be able to easily distinguish between what is a legal product and what is not, and that they need to know where and how to get legal and safe cannabis. Branding and advertising with agreed upon parameters provide consumers with the signposting that they need uh, to distinguish legitimate products and sources so that adult Canadians better understand exactly what they are buying and who they are buying it from. You are no doubt aware that the black market is very entrenched in Canada, a brief scan of the headlines demonstrates the prevailing confusion about the legality of the cannabis stores that have mushroom on main streets across the country. The legal medical market represents a very small fraction of the cannabis consumed in this country today. If governments are serious about undermining the black market and want to do it as quickly as possible, they need to ensure that legal businesses have the opportunity to distinguish their products from the illegal. Dislodging the entrenched black market more quickly simultaneously minimizes harm and increases the availability of tax dollars earmarked for important policy goals such as public education. Public education is important to us too. Part of our mandate is to serve as a trusted resource on issues related to the safe and responsible use of cannabis for medical and non-medical purposes. In that regard, we share research and develop information for doctors and consumers to help guide choices and safe use. This conference is the first of many initiatives that seek to inform a broader audience. We hope that you will find the topics and speakers interesting and engaging today and that you will uh, contribute to the information sharing. We had a very uh, active day yesterday as well and I think everybody uh, left the uh, conference. We're very happy with the discussion we were having. Uh, je tiens aussi à signaler à nos participants francophones que même si les présentations se font en anglais, uh, veuillez s'il vous plaît uh, vous sentir bien à l'aise de poser vos questions dans la langue de vos choix. Thank you everyone for your attentiveness. Enjoy the conference, for sure. And our first speaker is going to be Dr. Uh, Bing Yan. She's the president and CEO of Emerald Health Botanicals in British Columbia. Uh, she joined Emerald Health in December 2014. She's an executive leader with over 20 years of experience in life sciences. 
Her career began with Adelix Crop Technologies, where she spent six years as a plant research scientist. For a number of years, Bin was also the president and CEO of Cytopax Biotechnologies, a Canadian biotechnology company. Following that, she led Wex Pharmaceuticals, a subsidiary of publicly listed CK Life Sciences International Holdings, it's incorporated, as president and CEO again. Bin has a PhD in plant cell biology from the University of East Anglia, UK, and an MBA from the University of Toronto. Please welcome uh, Bin to, uh, to present Medical Cannabis 101. Thank you. Everyone. It's my uh, good morning. It's my pleasure to share my notes with you on medical cannabis. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and thanks for spending Saturday morning with me. Um, how do I work the slides? Oh, here. Yes. Yeah, okay. Sorry, I should be more prepared. The green is going forward. Okay, so as Colette mentioned, I work for Emerald Health Botanicals. Uh, Emerald Health Therapeutics is a parent company that's listed on the uh, uh, Toronto uh, TSX uh, Ventures. Um, we are based in uh, our operations in, it's in Victoria, uh, British Columbia, and we provide both dry and uh, cannabis and cannabis oil to, uh, to our patients. So today I'd like to cover um, a range of topics from the endocannabinoid system, which explains how our body interacts with cannabinoids and uh, the physiological effects uh, of, the, uh, of the interaction. And also want to touch a bit on the plant, the cannabinoids and the terpenes, and also the medical application of cannabis and cannabinoids. Yeah, just briefly on clinical evidence and the dosing and the risks associated with, uh, with the product. Uh, a little bit on herbals, uh, herbal synergy, which is a common phenomenon with herbal medicine. In cannabis, we call it, the, it's coined as um, entourage effect. And then, where to be, where to access safe and legal cannabis, of course, that under the uh, ACMPR program today. And um, so, without further ado, the endocannabinoid system uh, in human is a very conserved. So, uh, a very ancient, it's 600 million years, years old, it's older than plants and, and animals. It's a very ancient and very conserved system. What that means is, whether it's in little mice or big elephants, they all have a similar system interacting with cannabinoids. And uh, it's basically, I should, um, um, uh, the uh, point is, just excuse me for one second. This works. Um, so the endocannabinoid system is made of uh, a number of uh, uh, things. One is the receptors that's in our human body and CB1, CB2. Another group of compound is the uh, endocannabinoids. THC is cannabinoid from plants, but endocannabinoids are the ones that our bodies make ourselves. The interaction of, in, uh, of cannabinoids and the receptors leads to a cascade of physiological responses. It's a lipid, lipid um, signaling pathway there. And it has big impact on a number of physiological processes. And so those are the main components of the endocannabinoid system. And And also involved in the system are the enzymes that, that, are, that are responsible for the synthesis and aggregation of the different compounds, the receptors and the, um, and the uh, ligands, the binding molecules there. As I mentioned, it's ancient and it's conserved and it's involved in many physio physiological processes, including our central nerve system, brain development, neuron development, pain sensation, mood, and immune, even the immune system, as we know, immune system has impact on a number of medical conditions. So that's why the endocannabinoid system is terribly important in our human body function. Any abnormality would give you medical conditions or, like, um, or diseases. Um, like for example, it has been found that people with migraine have a lower level of endocannabinoid anandamide. 
And therefore, you know, that may explain why when you take some TAC, that might help because you supplement your body system. So that's, that's, that's why it's really important. It has a big impact on human health and, and wellness. Cannabinoids. So human, we make cannabinoids. The most common ones are anandamide and 2-AG, but plants also make cannabinoids. THC and CBD are the most common, most abundant, and very well st studied. And also there is another group that would be the synthetic ones. You can chemically synthesize cannabinoids or cannabinoid, cannabinoid analogs that function in similar ways. So those are the um, uh, uh, cannabinoids are lipid, uh, lipophilic, so they're soluble in fat, in lipid, but not in water. That's why when people take like uh, 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 cannabis uh, as tea, it helps to have some milk, not non-fat milk, but whole milk in, in the tea. Um, so those are the basics of uh, the endocannabinoid system, and it explains why there's so much medical implications that the whole system has. So before I get into plants, I just want to talk a little bit on uh, um, the uh, integrating medicine and health. It, my belief is that we should pay more health, pay, pay more attention to health, to the whole human system. Whereas the conventional medicine uh, usually, you know, we typically treat a disease of a particular part of our body. And with the with advance of modern technology and medicine, we're focusing on more, more smaller and smaller part of that disease. Um, the particular organ, particular symptom, or even particular molecule. But in fact, healthcare should really focus on, on health per se, maintenance of health. It's more than taking a medicine. It includes a whole, uh, a, a list of factors including what we eat, how we exercise, and um, uh, social interaction and mental health, and, and then medicine when it's needed. So, and also the whole, whole human body, I think, you know, having that balance, uh, homeostasis is really important for health. That, you know, the endocannabinoid system is a good example. When we miss something, something is too low, then, you know, we either do exercise or we supplement that to re re uh, return to health. So another point I want to make is the important role of plants. We actually rely, as humans, as animals, we rely on plants tremendously. Uh, food and, and, and also medicine. So it primary metabolites, the major components, major chemicals that plants make are your carbohydrates, sugar, protein, um, and, and, and lipid. Those are important for nutrition. There's a group of compounds that are, that are made by plants at lower level and also more, more specialized. Some plants make them, some plants don't. Those are called secondary metabolites. These are the ones that play a very important role in medicine. I list a long list of compounds here, but you can probably recognize them, caffeine, nicotine. Um, but um, uh, cocaine and morphine are used uh, with side effect, but it's used to treat uh, uh, medical conditions. I think um, looking for the um, uh, vincrastin. That is a cancer a chemotherapy agent found in plant, first approved by the FDA in the 1960s. But it has been used, and it's still being used today as the first line therapy, chemotherapy for cancer. So plant, well, it is, uh, is, has, we credit plant for giving us that medicine. Another common one is uh, Pactitaxel. Taxol is also a chemotherapy first line, and that comes from yew tree. Uh, by the way, the craftsman comes from periwinkle plant. So uh, uh, Taxol is listed uh, by the uh, World Health Organization as one of a short list of essential medicines for humankind. So that's the important role that plants play, and there is a terminology called pharmacocracy. That's the study of uh, um, plant or natural, natural products. Uh, how they uh, work, uh, the mode of action as, uh, as medicines. The other cannabinoids uh, are another great example that we'll get into. Um, okay, so uh, plants, uh, the cannabis plant. 
I think um, it's, it's, you know, we we'll probably, uh, most people are aware that cannabis has a, a long history of human use, thousands of years. It belongs to the same uh, family of plants as, um, as uh, um, hops, the, this, uh, the, the flowers you, you use to make a beer. Uh, hops are similar to cannabis in, in, in that they're very rich in terpenes and that gives you the aroma. And um, it can be used for food, fiber, and also medicine and recreational use as well. And um, hemp has been bred for fiber, so therefore they don't have a lot of cannabinoids, but they're really good with fiber. Uh, the yield is a lot higher than uh, cotton and then other, other plants as well. And marijuana, or the me medical cannabis, has been bred for high cannabinoid content because that's the active ingredient for the uh, physiological effect. Um, Okay, so it's dioecious. It means it's unlike most plants. Most plants you would have a female and male uh, uh, all need the same flower, but cannabis actually female plant versus male plant, they're in separate um, plants, two homes that means. So um, another interesting fact is the uh, the female flowers, not the male. The female flowers can have very high cannabinoid content, up to more than thirty percent. That's actually quite amazing for any plant organ to have that much of one particular type of compound. It's spread that way, that way by breeders. Um, the main components, as we know, is THC and CBD. Uh, Dr. McChildren from Israel is very famous for his discoveries of cannabinoids, THC, and synthesize of it, and the mode, the finding the receptor as well. But actually, during Prohibition, there was American chemist, uh, Adam Rogers, he actually first uh, identified and synthesized in the 1940s um, the CBD and other uh, compounds there. Interesting literature to, re to read if that's of interest to you. The genome, the DNA sequence of cannabis was first published by a group of scientists and that's, that scientist, uh, the scientist that led that group was, is uh, Dr. Jonathan Page. He was kind enough to lend his slides to me just to quickly introduce the, uh, the, the plant. Um, and, and the chemist, well, chemistry there. Just take a look at my time. Um, so the next eight slides actually came from uh, uh, Jonathan Page, and he's the founding CEO of Anandia Labs. He's also a professor of uh, U at University of uh, British Columbia. But he uh, he is really a leader in cannabis research, and he, like I said, is a group that published the uh, uh, <coughs> cannabis genome in 2011. So uh, his slides. Classification of cannabis, um, some consensus, but some debate still going on. Um, family of uh, cannabisia, and uh, cannabis is the genus, and sativa is the species. Whether sativa indica and ruderalis, whether they are uh, species or subspecies, there is some debate, but that's academic. I think for, you know, for practical purposes, we do have the indica and sativa. And those, uh, the major differences are probably the terpene com uh, composition as well, but you can actually easily distinguish them by looking at the plants. And uh, just based on people's experience, anecdotal experience, indica plants, uh, indica uh, cannabis seem, uh, tend to be more sedative and sativa more stimulating, and that gives you the high. And uh, the naming of cannabis is quite, uh, uh, what's the word to describe it, chaotic. Um, that's a, a reflection of the um, two things. One is the breeding work, actually breeding cannabis strains was done mostly under the ground because of the prohibition. So there was sort of probably not very good consensus about how we name these plants and, and um, how we standardize them. The other thing you can see is probably a recreational focus. Um, you know, higher and higher THC, and, and the names reflects that recreational uh, culture, in my view. But the point is, there is a wide diversity. There is a lot of strains, and, um, and many of them have been used for medical purposes, um, although the breeding was more for recreational purposes. The main compound active ingredient is THC and CBD. THC being the main one there, and uh, there is over a hundred um, types of cannabinoids, but the important ones for medical purposes are listed here. THC, CBD, CBC, CBG, THCV, and CBN, which is a degradation product of THC. 
Um, these two, CBD, THC, are the most abundant, and THC is the best studied. T uh, CBD, not as well, but we're getting more knowledge <coughs> of that. THC, as we know, is the cannabinoid that is responsible, mainly responsible for psychoactivity. That's responsible for getting high and getting the mood uh, the impact there. And it also, there's quite a bit of evidence to show that it relieves pain, and uh, some species releases um, uh, anxiety, uh, and, and anti-nausea and anti-vomiting, there's a lot of real clinical, medical, and scientific studies to support that. There's a drug approved for that, and the stiffness of uh, muscles and pain uh, associated with uh, fibromyalgia and MS. So then there's um, quite extensive literature supporting that. So that's TAC, medical effect, and also that's the only thing, that, that only compound that gives you high in cannabis. Others don't. TAC, uh, CBD is not psychoactive, for, for example. But T uh, CBD has therapeutic effect reported, and um, anti-inflammatory, and, and, and also pain relief, and neuroprotective, and there's also evidence to show that CBD actually counters some of the uh, psychoactive effect of uh, um, THC, and therefore when you mix the two together, it doesn't give quite give you that kind of high. So research data is building, and uh, we're learning more and more. And I'll talk more about the epilepsy, because GW Pharmaceuticals actually is doing a phase three with uh, amazing data showing that it really it is really effective uh, for uh, uh, epilepsy seizures in children. Um, okay, so all of the cannabinoids are synthesized as acid in plants. One is decarboxylated. When the COO2 group there is removed, it becomes a neutral form that's called TAC. So this is like, for example, 340 molecular weight compound. When that's removed, it be, this weight is about 88% of the, the, the acid um, uh, molecule. Uh, the point here is that TCA acid is actually not psychoactive. So if you eat salad, if you make juice, it doesn't give you the high. It shouldn't give you the high. What gives you the uh, psychoactivity is THC. So in order for the psychoactivity to be there, you need to do the decarboxylation as usually done by heating. Um, you know, 20 minutes or so, even less, then it converts to uh, the, what we call the neutral form from the native or the acid form. And uh, again, um, THC is the only psychoactive compound in cannabis. Other, other molecules are not. Um, another group of very important compounds in cannabis is terpenes, and that is what gives you the aroma, and that you know, aromatherapy uses uh, the, these compounds extensively as well. Morrison is, I think, mango is very rich in that, and uh, lemonin is uh, in um, um, lavender. So, um, uh, sorry, uh, that's lemon. Lemonin and uh, linalu is uh, uh, primarily from uh, lavender and uh, caryophyllin is from black, uh, black pepper that also gives you, you know, some pain relief. And there is some uh, ac uh, biological activities reported for these different compounds. And we, you know, aromatherapy uses uh, lemon flavor, lemon aroma and uh, lavender quite extensively. So, but these are very rich in, um, not as rich as cannabinoids, but you, very detectable, very rich in uh, cannabis as well and uh, may have uh, uh, therapeutic effects on their own. Just, just an example of some of the strains that we have. Uh, you can, you know, they, each strain pretty much has quite different, distinct profiles of terpenes. Cannabinoids, yes, sometimes you have 20%, sometimes it's, you know, 5% TAC, and CBD, lower, higher level, different ratio, um, simpler, but uh, uh, terpenes, because there are so many of them, and uh, actually it's, you know, it, just based on the terpene profile, uh, in the future we may be able to kind of standardize the, the uh, naming of strains based on terpene profile. Um, so a few examples here, like uh, caroflin is very high in uh, headband, but not as high in blueberry. And blueberry has a lot of uh, 
piney, and that's what's in pine that gives you the piney uh, aroma. So it's a it's a kind of good signature of fingerprint for a particular strain um, to use the um, uh, terpene profile. Um, moving to medical applications, medical cannabis. It was a very long history of, uh, of human use. We hear about you know, more than 5,000 uh, use in China as, a, as one of the uh, essential herbs uh, in you know, one of the emperor's uh, uh, medical cabinet. And uh, in Europe, there was a lot of use as well. In fact, before prohibition, I uh, uh, take some photos of uh, the old medicine products from Eli Lilly, for example. And some other pharmaceutical companies, they actually uh, commercialized like cannabis extract as medicine. But then came prohibition, so no, um, no research, no very limited use. But in modern, um, uh, okay, so um, so long use, long history. But self medication has never stopped. People use it. People try it. Try and error, and people report their anecdotal experience and share that. So we gained quite a bit of knowledge that way. But, uh, um, but also there was quite a bit of uh, research by pharmaceutical companies despite the challenges. It's very difficult to do research with cannabinoids when it's classified as a narcotic schedule one. But people did try. And so we end up learning quite a bit about uh, the, um, uh, uh, the data there, like the, the real uh, scientific data. PK studies. PK is pharmac uh, pharmacology. It tells you the interaction, like what we do to the drug, pharmacokinetic, like the, how, how much like degradation, absorption, and all that. It also tells you what the drug does to human. Uh, it's a chemical process. So PK studies have shown um, onset of action duration of action, and uh, also bioavailability of cannabinoids. So we know that uh, at intravenous injection, you get the drug right the, into your blood right away. Inhale, smoking and vaporization also gives you very quick onset of action. You can detect the cannabinoids in your, in your blood level very quickly, seconds at, at most minutes, you see that, but oral, if you take cannabis oil or other way, like it takes a longer time for it to get into your blood and to have that onset of action. It takes minutes, half an hour, one hour. The duration of action, if you take a smoke, vaporizing, um, it goes away quicker, and, um, and it, but if you take it orally, it stays there longer. So that's a general finding. There's reasonable consensus as to the duration of action and how long it takes to, uh, to get to your blood to have the effect. And in terms of bioavailability, what that means is if you take one cannabinoid, how much of that do you get into your blood? Intravenous injection, yes, 100% or close to 100% injection tend to, to give you the best availability. Oral and, uh, and inhale, um, somewhere around 20%, could be higher, could be lower, but that's the typical range of that um, um, uh, availability. And there's actually quite a bit of data on randomized controlled trials. RCTs when you know doctors and scientists they typically ask for RTC data because we respect the science there is very well designed and controlled and with the right sample size and, and, and everything. So there's actually quite a few, quite, quite a few hundred um, randomized uh, RCTs uh, with data, not only for the pharmaceutically uh, developed cannabinoids, but also for cannabis per se. I think you know some of the examples I have here. Marino is TAC. It's actually approved by FDA. Um, I think probably 1980s for um, appetite loss and uh, nausea and vomiting chemo-induced uh, in cancer patients. Uh, Sesame is the same, uh, similar compound. Sativex, some of you may be aware of Nabixmol. It's a mixture of TAC and CBD, and it's approved not in the US yet, but in like 16 different countries. It's a GW pharmaceutical product, and that's approved for um, multiple sclerosis and associated symptoms. And it's marketed in Canada and Germany and some of the major countries, but not in the US yet. And the 
new, uh, new is and the most exciting uh, results came from the CBD compound of uh, also by uh, GW Pharmaceuticals. It's for epilepsy syndromes, and it really, really improved, reduced the uh, number of frequency of seizure in little kids dramatically. So lots of uh, news and publicity, and uh, they are putting the rooms of documents together for the US FDA to approve this product. Um, so lots of research there, and, and cannabis is also actually um, uh, a randomized clinical uh, controlled uh, trials data. Um, it's less standardized for smoking. It's difficult to control how much you take and how you know the mode delivery. So it's not as precise as what we use to you, what we are used to uh, as, as medicines. But there is actually data to show the efficacy there. Um, in terms of the information, I think one of the best sources is the uh, monograph, what I call the monograph, or the uh, information for healthcare professionals. This is this was compiled by Health Canada in 2013 in anticipation of the launch of the MNPR program. It's like 150 plus pages, a thousand scientific peer-reviewed literatures, and um, has a lot of information. It's my bible of you know, medical cannabis, I go there. And um, uh, it talks about dosing, it talks about pharmacology, the onset of action, the duration, and availability. And there's one section that's on potential therapeutic uses, uh, but it also emphasize, emphasizes that cannabis, dried cannabis, not the uh, pharmaceutical cannabinoids, cannabis is not an approved product. So that kind of puts us in a dilemma. As a medical doctor, you cannot really prescribe a non-approved product. So this uh, system we have now, I think, you know, ACNPR, access uh, to um, uh, cannabis for medical purposes regulation, that came into effect April 2014. We, are, we were all learning. Health Canada was learning. Licensed producers were learning. You know, medi doc medical doctors were uh, are still learning as well how to handle a not approved, an uh, approved uh, uh, product. But I think with experience, we're getting very uh, much better at it. So section four was on potential therapeutic uses. So if you think about like what medical conditions you can use um, cannabis for, here is a list that people have tried and have uh, some uh, reports, have some publications on that. I should mention that all of this a lot of the, um, um, uh, the um, uh, well, I said all of the information has to do with TSC in that uh, Health Canada uh, monograph um, because that's the most studied. And others, um, T CBD, for example, we know very little of it other than it did wonders in those little kids with seizures because it actually doesn't bind CBE1 or CB2. It doesn't bind to any of the receptors that we know of yet. So it's just still a lot learning, um, but with like uh, like us um, us with uh, TAC, we get our therapeutic experience before we know how it works, and that's fine. I think Paxil, when it was first dis discovered and used for cancer, we didn't know how it worked, and now we know it actually interacts with um, uh, disturbs uh, disrupt uh, microtubules. So you know the the key thing is safety. Cannabis does have a very wide therapeutic window. It means, you know, it, it, the difference between the uh, effective dose and uh, uh, dangerous lethal dose is huge. So there's wide therapeutic window for us to uh, um, uh, try. So I mentioned all of the data, most of the data in the Health Canada uh, monograph is um, on TAC or TAC strains. Um, this is a publication of non-TAC um, uh, cannabinoids. So uh, CBD and CBEB and a number of others. And this is a publication that's co-authored by Dr. Machulin, the um, Israeli scientist who discovered TSC. And what they're looking at is to ask ourselves, what about other cannabinoids outside TSC? What do they do? So this is a summary we still don't have time to go through the list, but it just, it just shows that there is a lot of research by individuals and by uh, organizations on the different uh, uh, cannabinoids. So what do people use cannabinoids for or cannabis for? This is US data. The left is a bar, uh, is a pie chart that's uh, um, uh, collected from several US states, Colorado, Washington, Oregon, and California. 
uh, medical use, only medical use. This, this records what the patients registered for in terms of medical conditions. And you can see pain is like 64% under other conditions as well. So that's for registration when they qualify for the medical cannabis program. This is a California survey, and I think, you know, altogether a couple thousand uh, people, users. Uh, and this is survey, this is not when they qualify, but when they actually use, what do they use cannabis for? And anxiety is the top one there, and the second one is pain. I think the bottom line is a lot of patients use it for pain. And pain is a complex, complex condition. It could be caused, it, different causes, neuropathic, it could be non-neuropathic and uh, wear and tear, arthritis. So it can, can, the, the causes can be many kinds, like Crohn's disease cause pain, multiple sclerosis cause pain, and fibro, fibromyalgia. And um, it also has uh, variable cons consequences. If you have pain, you can't sleep well. If you have pain, you cannot move, and there are you know, a whole uh, sequence of cons consequences. Fortunately, we have a very um, a practical uh, BPI, and that is a brief pain inventory. That's just a two-page chart that just about every pain tri trial I'm aware of use that as a measurement tool. So it actually records on a daily basis over whatever two weeks or four weeks when you use any painkiller. It records your average pain, your worst pain, and the location of pain. It also reports like the quality of life, uh, the quality of life questions, interference with activity, interference with the mood, interference with your sleep, and sleep. Now it's easier to measure, measure with the labs, um, or even with a Fitbit, you can tell how, how much you sleep and how well you sleep at night. So if there's a good tool that people can use just to collect data, just to understand how the uh, drug works on you. Pharmaceutical companies use it in most of their pain studies, and I think you know some of uh, our patients will be using that too, just to get a better understanding of the interaction of cannabis and my symptoms. And in terms of clinical evidence, uh, there's, of course, because the, of the FDA or uh, European approved uh, uh, pharmaceutical cannabinoids, we actually know there is grains of data but uh, for purified uh, cannabinoids. But even with cannabis, despite this lack of standardization, there is good research to show that uh, one, just one, one of the many examples by Dr. Mark Weir, who is the uh, vice chair of the uh, legalization task force, um, his group published uh, a study over one year's medical cannabis use, and this is smoking, um, did have associated with the improvement in pain function, quality of and cognitive. And there's quite a few review, very good review, very nice done review articles by Dr. Ware and Dr. Lynch Halifax and Dr. Ethan Russo, um, who is you know very well known in the cannabis research field as well. Dosing, a lot of pain medication actually, uh, aspirin it says to take whatever, 50 milligram, but there is a lot of individual variation. The best thing to do with medical, uh, taking medicine for pain, uh, it's individualized and it sh one should try titration. Start low and uh, dose low. That's the strong advice we have for medical cannabis patients. And in terms of the amount, based on what we know about side effects, that's the mixture one to one uh, TACCPD. And the uh, Marinol, that's the pill, that's the capsule, you know, starting 2.5 to 5 milligram TAC per day is probably a reasonable um, a place to start. And um, I think in terms of uh, uh, CBD, because it doesn't bind to either of the receptors and we don't quite know like uh, the pharmacology as much, but uh, there is enough evidence to say that you need a lot more CBD than TSC for the biological activity. But the, I think the key message is, you know, for someone who is naive, if you know your body's response already, fine. If not, start going go slow, especially with oral, because it takes time for it to come into effect, and you take something and it doesn't work, you take more, and then you get overdose. It doesn't kill you, but overdose is not uh, comfortable. Um, 
Experience, Holland, average is uh, 0.7 gram per day. And Canada, this is uh, from the uh, ACMPA, uh, ACMPR data from the last quarter, September to, oh, sorry, October to December last year. The average shipment, that's a shipment, is 0.8 grams per day. It doesn't mean necessarily the use, but it's probably a good uh, estimate of uh, how much they use, or the minimum amount they would use, because if they buy, it's unlikely they waste it, but they may have other sources. So it could be a little higher, um, but 0.8 grams per day is the average there. Um, potency for dry product is probably 7 to 8 percent average, but we have seen as high as 30, 20 something percent, as low as 5 percent. So that's, the, uh, that's all I can say about dosing. It's really trial and error, but titration is key for cannabis particularly, but for any pain medication as well. Not benign, cannabis is not benign. There are risks there. I think you know the first risk come to mind is addiction. The addiction rate, this is NIDA, a US uh, National Institute of uh, Drug Abuse, their data. Tobacco has the highest addiction rate, and cannabis and caffeine about 9%, alcohol is 15%, and this kind of agrees with other international publications as well. So it's they are lower, the addiction rate is there, and it's lower than alcohol, it's a lot lower than tobacco. And addiction is a very interesting but very complex research, area of research that I'm not qualified to say too much about. The only thing I can say is that people t seem to be predisposed to uh, addiction. Um, some people, you know, they can drink alcohol until they're sick, but they never get addicted, but others are much prone to addiction. Why is that? We don't fully know, so just be careful. I think, you know, if some families have a, a, a propensity to get uh, addicted, then that's the place to be careful. The other thing is about age, which I'll talk a little later. Uh, in terms of, this is Lancet, a British uh, medical publication, um, talking about dependency uh, how, uh, uh, and, and also physical harm. And you can see uh, cannabis is here. It's been high, um, but it's, you know, it does have harm. It does have uh, dependency. Um, uh, tendency there. And alcohol, tobacco here, and heroin is up there is the worst, right? So another thing is age. Um, you know, the general consensus is that TAC is not good for your brain development, especially when you're under 18. But there is this window from 18 to 25. Uh, I think, you know, there are some research papers that say that brain are still developing up to the age of 25. And when I was at CCIC, that's the uh, clinical uh, conference um, I hear um, uh, in, in Toronto, um, I hear that um, you know there's this cannabis use disorder, technical term for addiction. Um, if you're over 40, there's very little risk for anybody to get addicted, or if you get addicted. Uh, some addiction is not as risky. So it's a safe age, 40, but that's kind of, you know, too high up there. But 25, between 18 to 25, it's hard. It, there is no consensus. If you look at like 100 publications, probably 60% would say, oh, there's a tendency of uh, impairment of memory and other things, but it's reversible. But there's another group that says, well, it's actually not the cannabis TNC that's doing it, it's the social environment. So a bit, a bit more research is needed there. But there is one good publication I, I want to bring from PNA as that's a very um, prestigious journal in the US. I bring it up here because it's actually over 30 years, 38 years study, over a thousand kids from like, from birth to 38 years old. And that's probably the biggest, most comprehensive I've seen. And there is tendency to show that you know you have a decline um, neurophysiological functions if uh, if, if, if uh, kids start using cannabis. Uh, the earlier the, the, the start, the, the bigger the, the damage. So I think before we know enough, just be careful, and it's parents' responsibility to tell kids. Yeah, we don't know enough. We don't know for sure it's terribly harmful, but just be careful because we have to say right? So another risk is, uh, it's not cannabis per se, but the smoking. I think smoking is just bad, period. And it gives you, uh, cannabis smoke gives you the same particles as tobacco smoking, and, and that is, um, 
you know, carcinogenic and causes cancer, it kills your cells, cytotoxic, mutagenic, it causes mutagenesis, you change your DNA. So all the nasty things that, you know, that could happen to anybody uh, is in that tobacco smoke, is that in Canada smoke. Unfortunately, because of culture, like a, a lot of patients, our patients, they started using our product smoking, but we see a very rapid change from smoking to vaporization. I think when we started the program, probably 70, 80% smoking, now it's over 50% vaporizing for the dry product. So it's already happening, it just takes time. I just wish it happened faster. Stop smoking, right? So it's just not good. Um, and uh, vaporization, there's not enough research to know how harmful it is to the lung. Um, you know, people vaporize for other compounds, not just uh, cannabis. It's, I don't know, it just doesn't sound very uh, lung friendly, but it's a lot better than smoking, that's for sure. I think, you know, uh, and then it, if we could, and, and, and also the dosing is hard to determine when you smoke or vaporize. Orally, it would be much better. Um, Okay, so other than this smoking mode of delivery, there are some other what we call the anti-cycle effect or adverse effect. And uh, with the pharmaceutical product, they have that monograph and they actually have this of uh, what's uh, uh, the uh, adverse effect. And um, euphoria was this bit funny as a, a side effect of Marino and it's pretty high incident rate, 24%. But most of our side effects and Marino, these are the pharmaceutical products, right, can add noise. Um, you know, the common side effect is rapid heartbeat, increase your heart rate, but not, generally not, uh, well tolerated, and dizziness and other central nerve system responses um, that are listed as side effect. I think that the, um, the key to managing risk, titration, start low, go slow, start low, go slow, and uh, individual dosing, just have to try it yourself and to find out the, the, uh, the dose that works but doesn't impact your function too much, absolutely no smoking, and, and avoidance in use before we know more about that. So that's the risk management part. Um, just briefly on um, uh, uh, the entourage effect, what we call the herbal synergy. There was a very famous article by Dr. Ethan Russo. He was the chief scientist at uh, GW Pharmaceuticals, but now he's uh, uh, advising uh, and giving uh, 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 talks to uh, at different uh, conferences. Um, he had a famous publication in 2011, and that's how we started using the entourage effect. It's basically, um, you know, talking about the interactive synergy between uh, between cannabis compounds. And this word was particularly used for cannabis. But what it means, it means the synergy between different compounds in herbal medicine, and that's very common for herbal medicine. When you take out a single compound molecule from Agnesia, it doesn't work the same way as Agnesia. Although you know that is the major active ingredient. So, to, but the research part, as you can appreciate, is not easy because there are so many compounds and you try each one at a different level and you try different combinations. That becomes a huge uh, matrix that you would have to test each one to know what is responsible for what. So the research is not quite there yet. Uh, but it is a very uh, fundamental to Chinese herbal medicine. The whole plant matters. You can't take just one molecule, you have to take the whole plant. The synergy on herbal research, I'll say, infancy, we know too little, we just know it works by experience. Um, precise, precise science is not uh, quite there yet because it requires a huge uh, sample size, it's just not practical to do. But there are some um, real scientific publications already show, showing the evidence. This is a, a publication showing that if you use CBD per se, like pure CBD, you would go, like, like typical pharmaceutical product, you have a bell curve, uh, the effect goes up and up after with the dose, and then it declines, right? It, it just uh, declines. This is showing a mice model, showing CBD. But if the CBD is in other echo, then you can, you know, you overcome that. You go higher, and these two are not the same scale, so this is 15, this is 20, but that's what's in the paper. Um, you keep going, so overcoming the shape, uh, the, the uh, cur uh, bell curve um, shows that you know if you have other compounds there, you can enhance the, uh, you can keep going up with the efficacy without uh, hitting that wall. So 
receiving that, so to, so to speak. So where do you get safe and uh, legal cannabis? This is the uh, health cannabis program it used to be called uh, uh, MFPR. And this is the only way to get uh, medical cannabis legally in Canada at this stage. And it's going to remain based on what we see in C, uh, BOC 45. It's going to remain for a while being the only system for medical cannabis. Um, so patients basically need a doctor's authorization and need to register with either how Canada or licensed producer. The new um, regulation that this came out last um, uh, August allows one to uh, grow some, but most patients still go um, to licensed producers. And I think the key element of uh, the regulation for licensed producers, personnel, good production practice, tracking and quality control and quality assurance and patient registration, um, those are the ones that you know you hear uh, again and again about the uh, the the regulation, which might still like most of those uh, may still stay in place after legalization for a recreational market as well. I think right now it's mail order only, and there is dry powder and oils, and and hopefully we can have a wider range of product or product uh, potency range in the future. Um, okay, so most of the products are um, uh, either TNC dominant or CBD or one to one, and there is right hundreds of strains by licensed producers, and there is um, uh, oils as well. I think uh, information sources, lots of website, um, Health Canada. Uh, Cannabis Canada, that's our association. Lyft also has a good uh, information source. And this is the uh, association um, we're members of. And I think you have seen this slide and uh, more new members coming. But right now, there's 34 companies owning all of the uh, um, 43 licenses. And all those 34 companies, I would say close to 20, belong to this organization. Um, I think collect, uh, my time is probably getting close, so I think instead of run, repeating what I just said, maybe I'll just open for questions. Certainly.